Live from the Computer History Museum in the heart of Silicon Valley, it's theCUBE. Covering OpenStack Silicon Valley 2016. Brought to you by Mirantis. Now, here are your hosts, John Furrier and Lisa Martin. Hey, welcome back everyone. We are live in Silicon Valley for day one of two days of live coverage of OpenStack SV, SV for Silicon Valley. This is Silicon Angles, the Cube, our flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier with my co-host Lisa Martin. Our next guest is Shannon Williams, co-founder of Rancher Labs, hot startup. Uh, been on the Cube before you guys. We talked to the other co-founder. Um, and uh, hot space. Damn. You know, go back 18 months, you, can see, you saw the, the, the middle of the fairway Docker containers. Now certainly they're playing through huge. Kubernetes on the doorstep. How does this all fit into what you guys are doing? You know, it's a, it's a really good uh, insight because I think 18 months ago when we were getting our company started, you know, we, were, we were trying to decide if the market was going to move really quickly or if this might be a, a sort of a longer burning thing, which as a startup is really important because you've got to figure out how quickly to grow, how much to invest in the team, how quickly to hire people. And there were a lot of really good indicators. We, we talked to a lot of large companies that, that were, were just sort of really impressed at the potential for containers to shake things up. And my co-founders and I, we, we, when we started building Rancher, we wanted to build an infrastructure platform that could basically consume you know, cloud resources from anywhere. Uh, virtual machines, physical machines, Amazon, you know, Google, wherever, and implement container management on top of those. And getting started early as the space was developing allowed us to you know, get our feet dirty with tools like Kubernetes and Mesos when they were just in their earliest stage, you know, contribute, learn about these yeah. platforms, and it's really, um, it's really helped us a lot because, you know, we started an alpha program back in the fall of 2014 mm -hmm. and ran that for about nine months, working with a lot of larger, you know, people we'd known from previous lives who had who were interested in using containers, and very quickly what we found was they were pushing us to move faster. You know, they were saying we need this stuff now, we've got teams that are already using Docker, yeah. we want to put it in production, and so it, it just spiraled. And so I got to ask you, one of the things Lisa and I were talking about before you came on, we were talking about you know, the Docker madness, or someone said Docker sanity. Yeah. I think Docker madness, because we have Cube Madness, which is our March Madness promotion, and Cube <laughs> folks know that, but you know, Docker has brought some sanity to the developer community, but they don't have a revenue model. And Kubernetes is coming in, OpenStack is shifting, Virt VM, VMware's changed, just saw a rumor come across the grid that you know, Pat Gelsinger might step down. So it's all this, VMware's in turmoil with virtual machines. So are you guys in the middle of all this action? Are you guys in the center of the tornado? Because if you think about like Docker and the revenue model potential of where this is going, it seems that you guys actually might be in the sweet spot, having a nice management platform for containers. Um, you do know, you guys see yourself that way? Yeah. We're an startup. open source company, so it's always, you know, you're always kind of, I think yeah. being in the middle of a tornado is always a good place to be as, an, <laughs> yeah, as a small startup because you want to get in and, and talk and work with a lot of customers. Yeah. And by implementing a platform that supports, you know, Docker's native orchestration swarm as well as Mesos and Kubernetes, we really appeal to a lot of larger organizations that really like the direction of containers are going, that they don't want to necessarily pick one tool to yeah. try and use across all the different projects. So in Switzerland their company. strategies, you guys look at that and say, hey, you know what? It We're not going to have really dogma well. with any one platform per se. And sake. it's more than just that because you look at a tool like Kubernetes, it's a great tool, it's a, it's a really powerful platform. Um, but if you're an organization putting it into production, you don't want to be building these Kubernetes clusters over and over again for each team. So delivering, using something like Rancher to build a container service that can support you know, one click deployment of Kubernetes infrastructure anywhere and then hand that off to your app development team. Team, that's really appealing. So a lot of the demand we're getting from, from the enterprise is, you know, my developers want to use containers, I want to have some sanity to that, and a, a nice open source tool like Rancher that provides a full platform for running containers, it just fits in really so well with the strategy. So you guys see yourself as a hedge or almost an insurance policy with a customer? In a way, that sounds what it sounds like. Is that I think it's, accurate? I think no? it's more of an enabler, but yeah, I agree. I think there is, you know, one of the problems with any early technology is there's a bit of analysis paralysis. People are afraid yeah. to bet on a tool, and especially big bets. Um, always, you know, there's always some leaders who will take those big bets and say, you know, yeah. we believe in, in some tool early on, but usually what you get is companies saying, look, uh, you know, team over here is telling us how great Kubernetes is. These guys over here love Swarm. I've got some other team who's been lobbying us to put in a Mesos cluster for the last year. 
um, I don't know which one to do. And so a tool like Rancher that supports them all and sort of says, look, orchestration is, you know, these schedulers are, are somewhat swappable. They all have value. They have different capabilities. They're all moving at their own pace. Don't pick one, put in a platform, let people use the tool that works best for them. It, it's like a light goes off. Like, yeah, we've used schedulers for a long time. Schedulers by themselves aren't that novel. Yeah. Schedulers have been part of IT for 20 years. Um, there's probably three today. There might be 10 in five years. Let's just, we'll build and out the just infrastructure. Just to kind of put it before we get Lisa's question is that uh, Martin Casada had a slide up on the keynote. Developers don't care about the old way Gartner report. They care about you know, you know, other developers, but the key is try and buy. To your point about these big bets, no one's, I mean, they're making a big bet in general, mm -hmm. but they're not making big bets at once. Yeah, we break the world into, there's two types of projects we see. So it's interesting, we're totally open source. And so very often we don't know somebody's using us till they call us. And so we'll get a call <laughs> yeah. and they'll be like, hey, we really like Rancher. We'd love you guys to come out and do an analysis of our implementation or we want support. But um, there, there's two uh, approaches. One of them is, it's a team, they've got an app, they've decided they want to run this on Kubernetes, they're using our distribution of Kubernetes and Rancher and they're going live. And they don't care what else is happening in the organization. This app is going live in two months and they are, they've already made their decisions, they're tried, they're using it, it's yeah. baked in. They're now just it's trying production to, track. They're just getting sign off by everyone and part of sign off might be having a support contract or having some you know, support. There's another side that is more strategic, you know, that's saying we want to build a container platform for our company. We're a Fortune 2000 company, and we want to we want to understand containers across the board and set global policy. But those guys, you know, they're actually moving much slower. There, that's where you get a lot of, well, let's try and do a lot of, yeah. of RFPs. Let's get some analysis, and it's surprising that those projects, not you know, not surprising, they'll take a lot lot longer to go anywhere. Um, but they're both happening. I mean, I see it both ways. I see some organizations that sort of have a lot of central control and they're sort of pushing a central vision and they're going to get there as, you know, here's our container platform, use that on whatever clouds you want to. And other ones where they've been given enough rope to run and they're taking tools, picking them and going live. And in a lot of ways, those projects are turning out to be quite successful because, you know, as always, if the team believes in the tools they're using, then they'll defend them and make them work. And if they own the decision to choose them, they're a lot more likely to, you know, fight to keep them all working and aligned and upgraded and everything else you need to do. So, you know, pros and cons of different models, I think it's going to be a mix, but I definitely agree with yeah. the sentiments that yeah. it's bottoms up. People yeah. try, they totally. test, they use open source tools. They talk to each other in the communities. Go ahead, sorry. Right. No, <laughs> we're no. Need to get in there. Great sorry. point. So you've been in business for a couple of years now uh, as open source software. Talk to us about some of the customers, some of the use cases that are really driving uh, the evolution, the maturation of, of Rancher. Yeah, there's a couple big, I'd say, buckets. One of the things we're seeing is um, early on in the first year, the people who were really taking containers into production were startups. They were SaaS companies, they were web services companies, they were online gaming companies, and they're just all sorts of types of companies. But they were generally um, you know, very, very knowledgeable DevOps teams at small startup-y type organizations that were writing cloud native applications and they were moving quickly. And they were just taking our stuff raw, even during the beta, going into production, and we'd find out about it later. Um, but towards the end of last year, we saw, started to see a shift. We saw government agencies, healthcare companies, insurance companies, um, a lot of telcos, a lot of companies in financial services that were um, you know, at an application level taking you know, tools like Kubernetes um, and implementing them with Rancher and allowing their teams or for their own team to put apps in production. So a shift towards more, I wouldn't say necessarily yet we were taking the legacy Java application, that's probably next year. This year what we're seeing a lot of is um, new applications, microservices driven applications, sort of uh, mode two applications in Gartner speak that are being written and being deployed using containers predominantly onto VMware and Amazon. I would say that you know if it's running on-prem, it seems to be running still in VMs, running on VMware. If it's being deployed in the cloud, it's going to Amazon, Azure, Google, you know, IBM or other cloud providers that people are consuming, but generally, you know, you're not quite to the point yet. I think if you look down the road, what you'll see more is containers running on bare metal and legacy applications moving to containers. We're already seeing it, you know, the beginnings of that. A lot of the questions that are coming in right now from users are, how do I run persistent workloads? And surprisingly, it, you know, it's actually quite straightforward. I don't think, I think a lot of people are, are, you know, the nature of a container is you have to attach a disk to it if you want to have persistence, but that's not that different than anything else. And so once people kind of understand it, they, they start moving. And so I expect, 
you know, next year to start seeing a lot of migration of existing workloads into containers to get better density and to get portability. So. Talk. Oh, right. just really quickly, John, yeah. thank you. Just um, one of the things I saw on your website was can, can running Docker really be that easy? Talk to us about the feedback loop that you're getting with your customers to drive the evolution of your software and to really become a, a leader, uh, maybe a, a sneaky leader in that space. Yeah, you know, everything in, um, in open source comes down to word of mouth. And, you know, the, the first thing you find when you put some software out there and, you know, kind of put it up on GitHub is you start to get bugs. People start to find, hey, this doesn't work, that doesn't work. And uh, you know, pretty quickly you get forums up and you start letting people talk to each other. And one of the things we saw really quickly as people started using Rancher was um, they liked that it had a really clean interface, that it had you know, support for different orchestration platforms, that it was you know, supporting plugging into your existing AD and your existing ops tools. And so um, about, about three months before we GA'd, we started reaching out to some of the more vocal people in our community and saying, hey, would you mind you know, sharing your stories and sharing a quote and, and kind of using it, using your, you know, being a case study for us. And I was amazed. I mean, I've been working in software for almost 20 years now and pulling case studies out of customers is pretty much the hardest thing to do. Can be, yeah. But in open source, it was just like, I mean, everyone from you know, large insurance, they were like, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll put a quote up, we'll write a blog. We'll, yeah. Sony came on one of our meetups and talked about how the PlayStation group was using containers. And people like Orange gave us quotes for our website. And yeah. we've had a ton of companies create their own videos that, where they like, talk about how they're using this or yeah. blog that's about it. That's great product validation it's too. Just, I mean, absolutely. that's yeah. what open source does for it. It is, it's a feedback loop. I think you yeah. said it perfectly, where they yeah. just, they want to share their use case. And one of the cool things we've seen, if you go to our YouTube channel, we've got these videos that are being created where users are just telling their story. But it's not like the old classic VMware, Cisco case study where you bring in a big, big team. It's like two guys sitting in front of a webcam saying, hey, I'm DevOps Joe 1 and this is DevOps Joe 2. And we just built uh, our whole CI CD platform on containers. This is how we're doing it. And it's very granular. It's yeah. not, I mean, they go through all the problems. Oh, this stuff isn't that good about this, but that's really good here. And so you get a very honest feedback that you know, you just don't get in general in technology. Right, best, best validation of what you're delivering through the voices of your customers. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what's the business model now? Obviously you got great traction on the customer front with the open source, so that's great testament. Is it just kind of like you have enough cash in the bank, you're not trying to force it, or is it standard support? How are you guys yeah, planning we, on making money? And not that it's a pressure point, but. You no, know, it is a pressure point, actually. It's always a pressure point, because the, the reality is, <laughs> yeah, you have to be able to build a business, I think. Um, and open source is starting, I think there's still a lot of questions in, in the investment community and in, in the general community is, um, you know, how are open source companies making money and how do, will you make money? We've, um, we've been very, uh, very focused on building a good open source project to begin with and not taking a closed core, or open core, closed function yeah. fo approach. So pure open source. Just pure open source, being open because what we find is that we get a ton of contributions and we get a lot of, a lot of attention. What we've been lucky and I think, I think is still very true is when people find value and they start to run real applications on it, we have no problem selling them supported versions of our product that they can count on running at yeah. enterprise grade, you know, five, nine level support. And so they want 24 by seven support. They want to know that the people who wrote the software can come and yeah. provide, you know, the so bug this fixes. this is classic, like, open source. Great software, and if it's in production, client yeah. will see value in a support contract. Yeah. They're not going to break the bank, but enough that's significant. Yeah, absolutely. It's not a tip jar, but it's, it's big. Exactly, it's real, because for them, yeah. I mean, the key is, uh, they want support. They yeah. also want to work with us. I think it's yeah. like anything. As you gr as you make a tool strategic, um, you want to have an engagement with the people working on that platform and, and supporting it. So we found a lot of success in that approach. We're also seeing a big growth among managed services companies who are using Rancher as the basis for their container service, where they're rolling out a container service to their customer base, and Rancher gives them a lot of flexibility. It gives them a multi-tenant platform, and we've built a model that allows them to charge for the software as they use it. So that all has been really appealing to companies that are using OpenStack, maybe building OpenStack-based public clouds or hosted managed services, a lot of VSPP type of companies that want to add containers to the portfolio. And that's Shannon, another great thanks market. for coming on theCUBE and sharing the insight. Final word I'll give to you, 
what what's next for you guys? What do you, what's your priorities? What are you gonna be doing? More really, open source, more all the time, all the time. You know, what's I think on? right now we're just uh, we're heading towards. A, there's a lot of. Uh, automation that's getting built around this stuff to solve even the more tricky problems, how to do really more complex failover, you know, better storage management. Um, but I think we're still in, in such an early growth phase. I think the focus is getting people successful and getting them talking about what they're doing, so. All right, Rancher Labs, from herding cats to herding cattle, and we've got other, other new opportunities. Congratulations on your success. Uh, young startup, kicking ass, taking names here in the open source community. I'm John Furrier, Lisa Martin. We'll be right back with more after this short break. You're watching theCUBE. Thanks for having me.